can't buy It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders uh, like the founders of Baby Einstein. Um, Julie Clark started the company in her basement. With, within five years, she grew it to $20 million, sold it to Disney, but that's not the most impressive part, Lee, in my opinion. Um, she, ta- you know, she calls herself a two-time cancer, cancer assassin, so she's defeated cancer twice, which is amazing. P90X uh, founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mime he would actually put out a hat and get money for his food and rent being a street mime, street performer before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars. The founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talked about how he was Steve Jobs' mentor and that Steve offered him uh, 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. So check those episodes out on uh, inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers, and we do that through our Done For You podcast solution that actually gets you ROI. I believe if you are a business, you should have a podcast, period. I personally credit it, Lee, to being the best thing I've ever done for my business and my life um, outside of my wife, but Jordan Harbinger, who's star of the Jordan Harbinger show, actually met his wife through his podcast, so he can say it is the single best thing he's done. Um, but it has allowed me to connect and form amazing relationships from my business partner. That's how we met to best friends and countless referral relationships and clients. And uh, we take your 30 minute conversation and distribute it everywhere. So basically you show up and talk, we take it and we create a dedicated blog post out of it, social media, and put it across all the podcast channels. I've been working with podcasters since 2009. Um, It's not just about your business. It's about leaving a legacy for yourself and your guests, you know, it's personal to me because the way I got into it is my grandfather, who is a Holocaust survivor, he survived Nazi Germany. And after being in concentration camps, him and his brother were the only people to survive. And there was a video that was published and uh, it's on my about page and the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with my grandfather and that has allowed his legacy to live on. And so I believe, yes, podcasting can help your business, but I believe it le- helps you leave a legacy. So if you have questions about podcasting, I will answer any of them, all of them. You don't have to be a client. Um, you can email support at rise25.com. I am super excited. This is like many, many, many years that I've been wanting to have Lee on. I think she is the secret weapon behind many businesses that people, you know, a lot of people have heard of her, but a lot of people haven't. Um, and we have Lee Richter, who many top entrepreneurs I know call her a renaissance woman. And you'll, you'll understand why in a second. But Lee Richter was recognized by the San Francisco Business Times as one of their top 100 women business leaders in 2019. She's launched over a dozen successful businesses in the financial, education, and lifestyle sectors. Since 1984, her company Richter Communications has helped strategy and public relations campaigns with companies like Autodesk, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and many more. And, you know, there's there's a laundry list of companies, Lee, and I'll just name a few, but Richter Design Group, Richter Communications, the Event Planner Association, they have like tens and tens of thousands of people in her association that she created, Holistic Veterinary Care, a veterinary hospital, which she ran with her husband, Dr. Gary Richter, and MyPetThrives.com, which is an online community, and there's many more I'm not mentioning, but um, she is co-founder of MyPetThrives.com, which you could check out, which is a free resource for people who love their pets, who doesn't love their pets, and want to get the latest information on their health and education. I think I, she convinced me to get a dog, my wife wanted a dog, and she convinced me to be okay with that. So thank you for that, save, you know, another, you're saving one marriage at a time, Lee. She's also, she finds time as founder and executive director of the nonprofit Pet and Wildlife Fund, which donates veterinary services to pets and wildlife. And finally, I will not leave this out, Lee, and then I will stop talking and let you talk, but her number one claim to fame is being Abby's mom. And Abby, I've never met Abby, but she sounds like a very impressive uh, person. And she has done two TED Talks before she was 14. She published her first first book by age nine and four books by age 10. Lee, thank you for joining me. 
Yes, I'm so happy to be here. And yes, thank you for acknowledging Abby because that is my inspiration to create a legacy, which yeah. is our action you and I have is we love inspiring people to pay attention to their legacy and the legacy of others. You know, one thing uh, I'm going to have you do in a second, but before we do it, I'm going to have you give a brief, there's so many cool things you've done. I want you to just do like a rapid fire, like, what did Lee look like from age five till the present and what, what kind of jobs you did and what kind of, um, you know, companies you started. But before we get there, I just want to stick on the Abby subject for a second because, you know, being um, a dad of two girls and many people out there are parents, I'm really interested in some of the things you did to, um, that you do with Abby to inspire her to want to do talks and publish books and what were some of the values you uh, place, you and your husband place with Abby and some of the things you did with her? Well, well, you know, kids tell you who they are. I can't yeah. really place any of my ideas on her. What I learned even early on is to find out where she blossoms and what makes her happy and just kind of like support her in shining as much as she can in those areas. And what happened was she really likes to make money. She actually is an entrepreneur in so many ways. Mm. Even though she said she wants to be a pediatrician one day, and I will support her in that if that's where she goes, um, she just really enjoys creating things and making money. So I sent her to an entrepreneur camp. And in entrepreneur camp, she saw uh, firsthand how to create a business plan, and they created a business plan, and then they learned a SWOT analysis, and then they learned to come up with a project idea, and then to get to get other people to vote on it. And by the way, they voted on her project idea. And then 60 kids got behind it. And then they did things like even call Costco to see if they would carry it. So she learned the whole way of how to come up with the concept mm. and idea, do a mini sprint, to get other people behind you, and then also to bring it to market. And what was beautiful in that is that um, she learned how to write her book and publish her book, which was fabulous. She learned it from another kid. She didn't even learn it from me. She learned it from someone else because their grandmother helped them do it. And she went to the grandmother. Her name is Jan Black. And she went to Jan and said, will you help me do a book? And so she did. So she made her own collaboration. And then as it moved on, I helped her get pictures together and I supported her. Um, but every step of the way, it had to be her idea. And every mm. step of the way, how she executed was her idea. She might come for a little advice, but frankly, she ran on with it all on her own. And she became a published author before I did. So she really did inspire me. Like, I'm like, well, if she did it, I better do it. <laughs> no and excuse I, for I, you. Yeah. Exactly. And my friend Mike King has actually um, inspired her to really get the word out and share that book. And he put her on stage in front of 500 people. And Lisa Nichols put her on stage and she got to sell her book to 500 people there as well. It's actually 650 people in attendance that day. And um, just seeing her shine like that and inspire others was really beautiful. And, and then I got my book done as soon as she was finished. <laughs> so that's been a beautiful trek. But I, all along the way, even now, I really have learned to let her let me know it's important to her. And then I just, you know, dive in with her and support her. And I can't really direct her. You know, people think she's your daughter. Of course, she did that. I'm like, no, she does what she wants to do. And I just help her as best I can. So one of the things you did to support her is you found this entrepreneur camp to just kind of foster that whatever she had inside of her. Absolutely. It happens to be at Stanford and I live near Stanford, so it was convenient. And they stay there for six days. They go on a Sunday. They stay on campus. They stay in the dorms. They stay with kids around the world. Her roommate one year was from Japan. One year was from China. She met people in other cultures. By the way, their whole family rented a house down the street and the entire family came with them. Mm. Whereas me, I could just drive 30 miles and we were there, or not <laughs> even. But um, I really appreciated the fact that other people were coming from a global audience. And for me, it was just our backyard and I got to be part of it. Um, she learned that she really loved being on campus. She loved eating in the mess hall and the choices for vegetarian salad. And all those little things were important to her. So when she's going for her college experience, some of those things will mm. also be her checklist then. Maybe she'll be back at Stanford. Who knows? Let's plug her books. What what books should people check out? Oh, she, well, they can go to abbyrichter.com, which is A-B-B-E-Y, Abby Richter, R-I-C-H-T-E-R, mm -hmm. abbyrichter.com. And there's a little bit of her story. I think um, her two TED Talks are on there and nice. then links to her books on Amazon. And she was in American Girl Magazine and did all kinds of fun things. The beauty is, is she has uh, raised money for two different charities. 
Hmm. One is called the Nobel Peace Prize family. It's called Pets for World Peace. And the other one is the Pet and Wildlife Fund, which we work on. And each year she gives 10% of her um, money that she's generated to each of the charities. And I think that's her favorite part of it is creating the check and making the donations. She feels like she's making a positive impact. Totally. So when she, I mean, when she grows up, quote unquote, she said maybe she wants to be a pediatrician. Who knows if they'll change. Take me back to young Lee and Ooh, yeah. to the present timeline. Wow. Well, you know, recently I've been looking at my past and seeing why do I do some of the things I do. And in most of it I'm celebrating because I'm like, wow, I found out early on I really love marketing and advertising because when I was six years old, um, I was one of the last five finalists in Little Miss America, and the five finalists all received an agent. And my agent was named Dick Miller. And Dick Miller, I was part of the Dick Miller Enterprises, and I was a SAG um, a person who did commercials and did all kinds of things when I was little. So from when I was around six to 12, I did cur commercials for Oscar Mayer hot dogs mm. and Wonder Bread and Clairol shampoo and Lipton Ringo noodle soup and all these different things, these campaigns, Sears catalogs, JC Penney catalogs. And so what I learned was not only was I part of the marketing and the advertising before, during and after, but we had after parties and we got to hang out with the other actors. And I just got to get the feel of what was it like to be in that lifestyle. Now it really wasn't for me. I really liked the marketing PR side not in front of the camera. I liked it actually behind the camera more, but it turned me into some of those skills that I use today in my, in my agency, helping people tell their stories. Because every one of those commercials was really a campaign telling a story. We were storytellers all the way back then. And that's really what we still are now. And I love fine tuning that craft. So the first thing I started out was in advertising. Of course, you know, when I was in my Girl Scout troop, I was the number one sales of chocolate and candy bars and whatever it was you could probably double the number and that's how many sales I had and I wanted TV and all kinds of trips and I just had fun whenever it was a contest I was really motivated to you know really do my best and, and win that prize so I learned I was really motivated by things like that um, my first job out of college was with Merrill Lynch as a series 7 broker I worked with them uh, for 14 years so I worked in the financial institution they put us through Wharton School of Business. We had a two-year class that they taught us finance, and we're, we worked with Lou Holtz. Uh, Lou Holtz was one of my first coaches, and he rewired us around our family money stories. Hmm. What did um, he do? Like, was that through Wharton? or? Yeah, actually, they sponsored it. We worked in the Twin Towers in Manhattan. Um, ironically, I saw Lou Holtz last year, and we got to reminisce about this time, because it's, it's a time capsule for him, too, because number one, it was in the Twin Towers, which needless to say, don't exist any longer, but those memories were so deep of, of that training around how could we show up for other people and have a clean slate for their money stories if we had our own stories that we were wrestling with. So over those two years, we did many exercises around, there were 50 of us total in the group. Um, we did many exercises around how do we eliminate those money stories or how do we tell them and then restructure them so that they were something that worked to our advantage. So, you know, some of our money stories might have been get your head out of the clouds or money doesn't grow on trees, um, which, you know, someone in my group was like, well, paper grows on trees. And so <laughs> doesn't grow on trees. So we had to, you know, overcome objections back then, things that our clients would say to us, we would practice and role play, play in the room. So in that era, we actually had physical stock certificates and physical coupons, municipal bonds that people would cut cut the coupon and bring it in for their payment. Like it was a different world before computers. And we had to learn that when people physically came in with their certificates, how do we keep the money in the company so that we can reinvest it for them? So we had to understand what their money story was so we could best learn how to help them. So by understanding all those different money stories amongst ourselves, it then prepared us with how to overcome those objections or get on the path of enlightenment with our clients. So I look back now and I'm like so grateful I went through that because in my adulthood I see that by eliminating those stories I've been stronger with my relationships with money. So I've been more in the flow of actually paying attention to welcoming money into my life and when I use money I literally say thank you for serving me, now go out in the world, become multiplied and come back. And then when it does come back I'm not even surprised anymore, you know, like 
Sometimes it's a six figure check will come back and I'll be like, I didn't even know that was coming. And I think it's because this practice has been part of my life, my whole adulthood, that um, I enjoy being in the flow. I enjoy my relationship with money. And it's one of the things I love to teach people is to pay attention. Because earlier you mentioned I have a holistic veterinary hospital. And one of the things about being in holistic care, whether it's for people or animals or yourself, a lot of holistic practitioners I've seen along the way have a saying of, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it to share my expertise. Mm. I'm in it for my joy. And it might not just be holistic doctors. It's people in finance. It's people in advertising as well. They come from the, this is my passion, my joy. I want to share it. I don't care how much I get paid. And then I see a trend of a lot of times they're just barely making ends meet or they're actually stressed about money. Whereas I believe if you welcome it and the more you welcome it, the more you can help more people then being in that flow is a lot more fun. And so that's one of the things I love teaching people that I've learned along the ways. And that magical time I was able to coach with people like Lou Holtz was the beginning of that. We'll keep on them after the Maryland's journey, but I want to stick on that for a second, Lee, because I think it's so important. What do you tell someone who says, I hear that all the time, you know, I'm not in it for money. And especially like in maybe healing professions, they're just, they want to help people, but they should be compensated. How do you help or what would you tell them or what would Lou Holtz tell them? How did they get past that in their mind? Well, I start with some, some thought provoking questions, which is where did that start from? And, I, and basically when you go seven layers deep, you know, I've learned this from several people, including back in my work in education is, is start asking seven layers of questions. So the first thing I would be like, are you open to exploring why you have that perspective? And if they say yes, I'll say, okay, so where did that perspective start? And they might tell me. And from that question, I'll ask another question. And when I get to like the fifth and sixth layer, that's when the real deep answers start coming out as to why they feel that way. And it might be something that happened in their childhood. It might be something that happened in their, their longevity of their family. It could be eight generations back that's been passed on. Once you discover what that is, then you start looking for the antidote or the opposite feeling. Or what would they prefer to replace it with? Because when you come back with, what well, would you prefer to replace it so that you're in the flow so that you can take more time and help more people? Like when I look at my husband, he was, you know, he recently won a, um, another award. He's won 50 awards in the last 10 years. And one of them was practitioner of the year in holistic medicine. So now other countries are calling and saying, can you come teach our veterinarians integrative medicine? So literally a group of veterinarians from India called and said, can you please come over and teach us? And to him, I'm asking, what's your motivation that you want to go all the way over there? Why, why don't they come here to you? If you want to go all the way over there and teach them, what's your motivation? He's like, I want to make it better in my whole industry. So now I know what his motivation is. Now I can support him better. It's not just to go to India. It's really to advance his industry by reaching people in other corners of the world and starting the movement of education. It's not just a trip to India. It's about those people. So now that I know that I can look at that motivation. So I think that's what happens with everyone. Once you understand what the motivation is, then you can see, is, it, is the spread sprouting in the direction you want it to? Are you actually ending up with an orange tree when you wanted a fig tree? Or are you actually going for the orange tree? Just be clear about what you want in the end, and then that's reverse engineer it to get there. I think the money conversation, a lot of people have it. They say it subconsciously, but they say it out loud, and they're not really thinking about it. So I'm helping them actually think about it. And I think part of it was my training at Merrill Lynch. It was a conversation every day with my clients. What do you really want? And then we'd reverse engineer it. I want to be free at the age of 50 so I can make these decisions. I want to take care of my mom and buy her a house. I want to make sure my brother has a college education. Whatever it is, mm. then we can create the income streams and the desire to mm. meet them. But yeah. until we know what they really want, I have no idea. It's like a stab in the dark of yeah. having Helping so. them discover their true motivations. And then from there, they can really kind of reverse engineer what that looks like. When like people that. say they're not in it for the money, though, it is kind of like, oh, then why are you wasting your time? Because you need that resource. To, that's what's our currency right now. Time is our number one currency. And the actual money to do those things, which means freedom of choice of your time, um, they're all intertwined. So. Yeah. They, they will discover things often are embedded when they were younger or they used as a, a way to um, escape something or deal with something, but maybe they don't need it anymore and they can just change it. 
Um, but I can tell you, if I look at my family personally, and I'm the oldest of seven siblings, right? Wow. All six of them are clustered the same around their thoughts about money and their lifestyle, which is they work to make a paycheck to have a life, right? So their cycle is always earn and then spend, earn and then spend. And it's hard to get ahead. And they sometimes use the factor of life is hard. Like if I go visit, oh, I have to work. I can't afford to take time off. And I'm like, wow, well, you know, I have to leave my work, be on a plane, be time off, but it's important enough that I'm going to do that. And I make it so that I can do that. Now I prefer to really go to Hawaii. So I do that a lot more. Take me um, with you. Yeah. <laughs> but I, do, I take that time off and it's important to me to have that time. And so I make the space for it. So it, people will make the space for what's important to them in the end too. Why if do you think you, Lee, made that shift in some, you know, sibling, you know, nature versus nurture, you know, obviously they grew up in the same house. What allowed you to make that shift um, and maybe not some of your close family? I think started with this education, but also getting the tools of understanding how the markets work and how to invest. I mean, back then when I was working, um, some of the stocks that are, you know, inflated beyond belief, um, Berkshire Hathaway being one of them, Berkshire Hathaway at the time was $500 a share and we thought that was a lot of money. And now looking back, we had opportunities then though, like I have Apple that I bought in the 90s and you know, has a $2,000 cost basis that's hundreds of thousands of dollars now. And I'm like, we had different opportunities. Then. And yes, some of them will happen today, but a lot of the things that needed to happen happened by 2008 already. You know, a lot of the brand new things that came out were, have been established up until 2008. So we'll look for the next wave. And yes, with AI and VR and with what's coming, there's going to be a lot of unpredictability and a lot of opportunity happen but you have to be ready for it. Like one of the things that I'm talking to my wealth advisors about right now is uh, keeping things in a cash position for a buying opportunity. I don't want to invest everything right now. I do want to have some cash there because if there's a pullback, it's everything on sale and I want to be able to pounce on it because I've seen wealthy people do that ahead of me. So it inspires me to be ready for when it's my turn. And, um, that's not always the way that people look at things. Sometimes they're like, it has to be invested. But no, sometimes it's okay to be in a cash position and wait for something to happen. So after Merrill Lynch, it was interesting. You don't see many people, what they studied in college is actually what they end up doing. You're, you actually, uh, you know, went to Florida, Gators. The, all the people Gators. I met, first of all, who were Gators are obsessed with yes. the school. But you actually Which majored in... Right that? now, yeah. my daughter's looking at colleges. And to get in UC Berkeley and Stanford is like a 4.1, 4.2 average. To get into be a Florida Gators, a 4.3 average right now. It's a difficult school to get into. There's a lot of people that are Florida Gators who would not qualify today. Because everyone in the state wants to go there. I don't know. but uh, It's a great school. And there's over 50,000 students. It's an incredible school. You there. majored in PR and marketing communications, which I did. is and not Danny normal. Was, uh, Danny Warfel, who won national championship best that year. and. He was in a lot of my classes, and it was just a life to behold. I will tell you, nothing better than being a Florida Gator. So after Merrill Lynch, what'd you do? You were there for a while. I was. Um, my husband graduated veterinary school. So he went there undergrad, grad, and then veterinary school. And we were together through that time. And in grad school, we got engaged. And in veterinary school, we got married. And he wanted to practice in Berkeley, California with like-minded people. Turns out he's a vegan. He was a vegetarian back then. But Where is he from? like-minded people who were thinking about integrative medicine, but also thinking about a lifestyle where being a vegetarian was not seen, seen as weird, was actually embraced. And I will tell you, being in Berkeley and Oakland and San Francisco, it's not unusual to be a vegan or vegetarian. He fits right in. And um, it's a great place for him to practice because people will come here for anywhere. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had someone fly in with their private jet and their dogs from Palm Springs on their way to Hawaii. Like all these people are coming from all over to find him. And because we're here in the Bay Area, it's a likely place. And they're like, of course you're there. It's, it, so it worked great for his career. And yeah, he has 25,000 current patients that have seen him. You know, last year when I was doing the numbers, it, it was in 12 months that our hospital had seen 25,000 transactions. And so by being here, people from all over will come see us, not just in the Bay Area. And so it was a, it was a good move for his career for sure. So what was the transition for you after Merrill Lynch? Did you help him open that hospital? I know your, one of your superpowers is 
is PR and, and marketing? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I guess we've never really talked about this. So what happened was my PR marketing company was doing spectacular. I had a lot of e-learning clients. I was in the e-learning forum at Stanford Research Institute. Uh, Autodesk, I was doing work with some other e-learning companies that have since been gobbled up by the big boys uh, were clients of mine. And I was in a near fatal car accident. Um, wow. And I went from, you know, absolutely incredible clients building their wealth, taking them from 25 to $100 million. And I went to flat on my back for nearly a year, 15 broken bones, both my oh legs, goodness. my back. It was traumatic. And my husband's medicine actually came in handy. All of his acumen came in handy because he helped 13 doctors. He kept them in line on how to put me back together. Hmm. And what happened during that period of time, the first you know, five or six months, I was flat on my back in the hospital. Um, we started having conversations about him and his work. And there were things he wanted to do. And because he worked with someone else, he couldn't do it the way he wanted to. And some of it was even taking care of like a homeless person's dog who needed help. And they're like, sorry, we can't do that. And he's like, my oath is to the dog. I have to take care of him. And I remember having this conversation with him saying, well, the only way you can do that is if it's your own practice. So while I was flat in the hospital, not doing my thing, all of a sudden he was opening his eyes to, I might have to get my own practice. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was the year of 9-11. And on 9-11, the owner of a practice was stuck in Australia and couldn't get back. And while he was in Australia, he decided to stay. He stayed and decided to put his practice up for sale, and that's the one we bought. And they call my husband the chosen one because more than like 20 veterinarians bid on it. But he chose my husband, and he and I took that practice over. It had been there since 1961. So I was Dr. reading Paris about that. Dr. Dr. James Harris Harris. had it for 40 years. It was amazing. And then mm -hmm. uh, we took it over. We had it for 18 years and built that practice. And about halfway through, um, my husband started doing the integrated medicine. So we launched Holistic Vet Care from scratch. And we built our hospital. It's about six or 7,000 square feet on Piedmont Avenue in Oakland, California. We took it down to the stud, built it from scratch. He put a pool in there and hyperbaric oxygen. And he does stem cell therapy. And everything's just very forward thinking. He has a cold laser in there. And he's just really, he and the team are just dedicated to best health for animals. And that's what they're doing. And so I'm here at the practice right now as we speak. I'm in one of the offices that we do educational seminars in. And um, yeah, we're supporting him in that. I want to talk more about that, but I, I have to go back to this car accident. That sounds yes. tragic and crazy. I don't know if it's too emotional to talk about what happened or not, but if it but isn't. I will tell you, my husband's book starts out with it. He does go mm -hmm. into it. Um, I've had many, many people over the years come up to me and say, oh, I never knew about your story until I read your husband's book. And uh, he talks about because he had to put me back together and he used integrative medicine to do it, the more he did it and saw it work, the more he's like, oh, I could do this for animals too. So there are gifts that happen in tragedies when you look for them. My two big gifts are number one, my husband learned how to put me back together and I can walk and I can be here today to have this conversation with you because I only had a 7% chance to live and wow. it really was a miracle. It's a miracle I'm even walking because I only had a 7% chance to walk once I did live. And um, a lot of it I attribute back to his love and care and just making sure I got the best care possible. And it was over a million dollar journey just to put me back together. And I do have some superhuman stuff and metal in me and stuff that they had to, that I had to overcome and learn to walk again. But, um, but it's all worth it. So my number one gift is my husband and his talent. And my number two is um, because I broke my back, I broke my L1, which was traumatic. They said, if you consider children, you have to go through adoption. And so we adopted really? Abby, who was born. And I always call her my gift from the accident. If the accident didn't happen, who knows if we would have been ever meeting on this planet, but we help each other be a lot better. So, so those are two big gifts. And every single day, I just, I start my day every day with today's the happiest day. And I love my life because it's such a gift. It mm. really is. So I, people can know me for many, many years and not know that that happened. And this will be a surprise to some people. I had people. no idea. Because uh, I don't let the accident define me. However, I do spend still about 15 to 20 hours a week just overcoming the results of that car accident with yeah. physical therapy and chiropractic. And I still get care on a regular basis. So I can go out in the world and be the best human yeah. possible. Well, it sounds like you took it and you found many reasons to be grateful and and something better comes out the other side 
It's true. And, you know, uh, Lee Brower is a good friend of mine. And he says, start every day big, which is be in gratitude. And even this morning, I had a team here. We, we had a, a gratitude circle first thing before we started. And just showing, you know, gratitude for each other being here and setting the tone for the day. Because when you're in gratitude, you can't be in anything else. You know, and it really is contagious. I absolutely love it. And it seems like it's become like the flow and everyone's talking about it these days. But in our, in our business, we actually brought gratitude and happiness science in about 10 or 11 years ago. And we've, been, we've done hundreds of gratitude circles together. Yeah. And um, it's really helped the team yeah. really understand one another so much better at a human existence. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now it's, it's not easier to say, but when you're in the moment, like that, that year or however long, you know, the, the acute situation happens, it's very, it must be very tough to think that way, though. It's interesting because I found out a couple things from that. And I'm so surprised we're going in this direction, but if you want me to talk about it. Yeah, so. totally. Um, they assign a trauma therapist to you when you're that close to death. And there was a trauma therapist that came in and he'd be like, wow, well, if ever you were going to be depressed, it'd be right now. But I never was. I just was like, what do I have to do to get out of here? Like everything, oh, you'll give me four hours physical therapy. How can I get five? Oh, we have that person coming in. Can I get more time with them? Can we bring an acupuncturist in? Like we just, we got magnet beds, so I didn't need to take pain medicine. And honestly, I couldn't wait to get off of pain medicine. And I wasn't fond of it at all because I like my brain the way it is. I didn't like messing with it. And so the magnet beds were a way for me to really be pain free. And considering I had 15 broken bones, my femur was broken in more than a dozen places. Oh That's my only God. one broken bone. And um, they put magnet therapy on it. I laid on magnet beds. I did, did whatever I could. And my husband would work with this surgeon and the chief of surgery. And the irony is many, many years later, what was so interesting about that is I started seeing a lot of my doctors and surgeons and physical therapists as clients in the vet hospital. And they were like, well, we saw how he treated you. Of course we wanted to treat our pets. And some of them came 30 or 40 miles away and sent their family in and their sisters and their moms because they're like, well, if you're going to go to any vet, has to be Dr. Richter because I saw how he treated his wife. And so you never know who's watching, right? But there were lots of little gifts that came out. And yes, being in gratitude is the biggest one because every day I was so grateful that I had another chance and I could, I could get out of there and walk again. And I was grateful my husband did stick by my side because the nurses did tell me they'd seen husbands leave for a lot less. And they were like, yeah, you're pretty lucky. I'm like, I think the smartest decision of your whole life is picking the right mate. And he proved me to be right about that. So. Wow. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, so you had a 7% chance of surviving, a 7% chance of walking. Was it because of just the femur was just sh like So many shot. things. Well, I broke my L1, which is on your spinal cord, which is the beginning of your spinal cord. So that's only 7% of the population does the spinal cord stop one early. And I was lucky enough I was part of that. But once we knew that, they were going in to fuse that bone. And once we knew that, my husband called friends from college that were orthopedic surgeons. And they're like, do not fuse your bone. Whatever you do, don't do it. And because he had that advice from people who were emotionally attached to me, um, he was able to, with strength, say, no, you will not do that. And this is what you can do. So he was my advocate. What I learned is, I was in my 30s when it happened, right? So what I learned is you need an advocate at every stage of your life. And they need to understand to speak. Me, I understand public relations and marketing. That's why our brand thrives is because I can do that speak. Attorneys, you need them to do certain things. Well, in medicine, you need somebody who understands the Latin roots of everything they're doing because he, there were times where my husband said, so you say, and I'm better to animals than you are to people? I don't think so, not when it's my wife. I am demanding you do this culture. I'm demanding you do this. I'm making sure you compound this. And so because he was my advocate, they had somebody paying attention. The protocols were different. Hmm. And so it's really important to have someone in your corner. It's more than ever. The hospital is a dangerous place if you're not paying attention. So luckily I survived. Amen. Thank you, Lee, for sharing that. Um, so you get out, you buy the, you guys buy the hospital, take it over. Um, what are you doing in your career at that point? Are you just heads down doing PR for the, because you've started many, many businesses. So talk about. Well, marketing company I took private clients I generally take three clients per quarter mm -hmm. I love to mentor them take them to the next level create a strategy so I'm still doing those my clients who actually 
I had before my accident waited until I was back on my feet and I was working with them. The people at Stanford Research Institute are part of the reason why I'm walking today too, because they played golf with the CEO of the hospital and frankly said, Lee's in the hospital, make sure you take care of her. And so they were even inside paying attention to me and mm. making, they would come to my husband and say, Dr. Richard, do you have everything you need? And they were clued in. So when I see you say you need a medical advocate, you need them in every corner. It is true, every corner. So a lot of people were, you know, really helping me through the whole process. When I got out, I still had my PR marketing clients. And then, yeah, I was building an empire for my husband, basically starting with his own practice, building his brand. We bought the hospital in 2001. Abby was born in 2004. So we were also working on adoption and that route. And then just even walking again, you know, I was still starting from scratch back then. Then over time, when Abby came into our life, you know, that became my full-time job. I really became a, a mom more than anything. And I still did projects and our projects, but I put a good team in place to support us. I moved my office inside the home for, you know, the next four years. Uh, even though I still have an office in the downtown Rotunda building, which is spectacular at City Hall. And I still have it now. Um, for that period of time, I mostly had my assistants come to the house and help me there. And, and just made, made loving my daughter, number one. And my husband showing up that same way. So really, we made that the center of our universe and still to this day do. Um, that's pretty much all of it. We're like, oh, we have three more years of high school left. Oh, I mean, her high school. <laughs> 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 but I mean, I feel like I'm in high school with her. It's just super fun. What were some things that worked to um, market the the practice, the hospital? That's a really good question because, you know, 2008 was the big turn, downturn here in the Bay Area. Yeah, you bought a business when it's like people are, you know, the more. economy's going down and people are, you they know. Never, and we had double digit growth every single year, including through those years. But what I mentioned to people looking back, it's so easy to have 2020 vision now and see like all those micro movements we did. So I have 13 different ways that I market to clients and you know, there's 13 weeks in a quarter. Isn't that convenient? So every week we're, we're deep diving in one of them. Is it going to be event planning? Is it going to be online marketing or JV partnerships? And we really dive in deep and say, what are we going to do this quarter on this topic? And so we did a lot of in-person things here in the community. I started a networking group. I created, you know, 50 other leaders around me that were referral partners. Whenever there were awards that people had a vote, they would be a supporter of mine. I would be a supporter of theirs, naturally because we're talented, not just because we were in the group, but because we picked the best people to be in the group. So the more that we networked, the more we did social media, the more we, did, we were part of the awards, whatever, each of those things led to different ways that people found us. And I took our client list from 3,000 current clients to 25,000 current clients in the 12 month period by doing those micro movements every day. Every day we posted, every day we did something, every day I wore shirts with our logos and met new people and invited them into the hospital. And it's amazing how many conversations were born just because of wearing a logo on a shirt. But I could be almost anywhere and people would see that logo and because our hospital had been around since the 1960s, they pour stories into me. They'd be like, oh, when I was little, that was my vet. Or my mom's going to that vet. So I had this opportunity to have conversations in the community and just networked and built those relationships. But also, I brought in feng shui experts to pay attention to energy inside the hospital with the team. I brought in the best team. I brought in incredible mentors that would come in. They taught the team happiness science, a PhD out of Stanford who met, um, teaches happiness science. I brought her in for eight classes. I brought in different mentors for myself and I'd share them. But I think just, you know, hiring the best people is the key. And also, people are really inspired and love working with my husband, Gary. So when they're there, they feel a sense of gratitude that they get to learn from someone so honorable and knowledgeable. So I tell them my biggest thing I do for the universe is share Gary. Because I could just keep him at home all to myself. But every time I share him, it's a gift to the community. It really is. So marketing and leadership seem to be two big staples that you talk about. Um, talk about the marketing a little bit. Um, you said 13 ways to market. If you can mention just a few that people should start to, you know, salivate over. Yeah, I actually have the, I was thinking when I said that, I have the original mind map I did of that maybe 15 years ago, a handwritten one in the other office. Wow. Um, so I know them by heart though. I mean, one week might be event planning and we could physically go to events. One would be 
social media. Now we're doing these things all the time, but each quarter we deep dive into one and we say, what are we going to do this quarter or next quarter that's even better? Um, that's how the uh, membership site came up, my uh, mypetthrives.com, because we're like, how do we make the client experience even better? Well, we create a community where they can come talk amongst themselves or post pictures. Like we have pets right now that have come in that didn't walk for six months. And now all of a sudden, you know, three weeks after seeing us, they're walking again. Well, I want a place where they can share those stories so that mm. when they can see other people are inspired by their story, but also they can celebrate their story of success. Or if they have a pet that passes away, they can celebrate, celebrate the story of the life of the pet that they love. So that's what inspired this. Um, a lot is online right now, but really a lot is on site as well. One of the things that's different than me in a lot of the circles I'm in is I actually have bricks and mortar places where people have to find parking and pay meters and come inside and actually pay, make a big effort to see us. So I'm always paying attention to that client journey. So every little piece of it, where can we be even better in the social media where we, we highlight their pet or in awards, applying for awards is another one of them. Where are awards that we can apply for, but also where are there awards we can give to other people to recognize them hmm. as being exceptional as what they do, whether it's a professional or a client or even just a child who loves their pet so much they go to extremes to take care of them. What can I do to highlight them? So that might be an award. Another one is JV Partnerships. One of the reasons I launched the company, The Pet Concierge, is because I own it, my husband doesn't own it, who's a veterinarian. Veterinarians cannot do affiliate relationships. They cannot do a kickback to anyone. But if I'm creating education and I want to include an affiliate and say thank you by doing a percentage of sales to them, I can do it through The Pet Concierge. I can because no veterinarian owns it, so then it's a separate company. So that was the purpose behind that, so that I can bring products, I can bring speakers, I can bring experts, I can create licensing, accreditation, all of that, and I can have partners in that in a different way. So each one has a well-thought-out strategy. It might not seem like it's obvious on the surface, but when my accountant and my tax attorney and all those people are lined up, they're saying, here's how you can do it where it makes sense. So that's why we have a nonprofit. It's a place that the, the doctors and the team can make a difference in a positive way, but we can also raise money from the community to support it. So both the community gets to have a hand in doing something good and the team gets a hand in doing something even better than they do every other day. I mean, they'll come in on their day off and do a surgery just to help a pet. And then I can have the pet and wildlife and take care of it. And it's a win-win for everybody. Right. Yeah. It feels like you go through great lengths and it's not for, just self, you know, purpose for yourself, but it's to give back like all those entities or how you set it up. So you can give recognition or give, you know, revenue or whatever it is with, you know, the people organizations that would uh, kind of keep that, that circle going. Um, but that's the number one way that we did those micro movements in all those years. So that in 2008, one of the things that our vendor said, our cardiologists, radiologists that go to all the different hospitals, they would come to our hospital and be like, your waiting room is bursting at the seams. And I just came to other waiting rooms and it's hollowed halls. What's the difference? Well, the difference was those micro movements I did every day for those eight years up until then. So that it wasn't new and it wasn't just starting out of desperation. It was really how we were building community. We were living in that. We were living in events. We were happy to share our brand. We were happy to wear our logo. We were happy to shout from the rooftops that we're here to help you. And we just continue to do that today. It's never changed. So in an up market or a down market, we still behave the same. And I think that, that the consistency is the key, though. That is the number one. Yeah. Thing. And Lee, you know, mypetthrives.com. Um, I know, you know, it's busy. You have a million things going on. So I'm <clears throat> somewhat shocked, but not really, I guess, because it's you that you are starting something else. But um, Talk about the client journey. I know we before we hit record, we talked about you pay very close attention. And you even you have it probably you're looking at it. We can't see it if you're watching the video, but the client journey. Talk a little bit about the client journey of mypetthrives.com. I'll bring it right over for you. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, as Lee walks over there, you can check out. This is one of them. Yeah. Now it's all electronic now. Can you see that? Uh, okay. yes. I'm so here's right. part of our client journey that we've mapped out with the team. And the first thing we're talking about is what are they feeling like when they come to us? 
What are they doing? What are they thinking and expecting? Who are the people involved in their experience? And then are they using their phones? Are they talking to the people at the front desk? Are they on a computer? So it's like, we want to understand exactly where they are. What are they feeling? What are they doing? Now this has been turned into an Asana project and it's got legs further than this. How do we talk to them in the beginning? So what happens with us is we launched a product and when we launched that product, it drove book sales. When it drove book sales, all of a sudden people were Googling us and finding out the number to our office. And we were getting 200 calls a day originally. And then overnight it went to about four or 500 calls a day, just yes. based on people having questions and wanting to reach us. So what we had to think of is in the client journey, what can we do in the beginning to make sure they're getting the right person to answer the calls from the beginning? If it's someone about the product, it should go to our 800 number. That's the team there ready to answer those questions. But if it's somebody who wants to come see the doctor, it should come to our team here physically so we can make an appointment for them and get them in in person. So the first thing we had to think about was, where's the intersection of that knowledge and how do we get them to the next point that's right for them where they're enjoying their experience? So we brought in an expert and we put bots on the website and we started with the first two questions of, are you calling about the product or do you need to see a doctor so we would know where to direct them? But then that took our calls back to a better amount to manage every day, but also put them in the right arena. When we got them, we knew how to serve them. But it came out of the, where, how, what are they feeling? What are they doing? And what apparatus are they using to reach us so that we knew how to meet them where they are? So if they're on the computer, the bot comes in handy, right? But if they're calling from the phone, the bot does not come in handy. But what do we do then? But my team is literally walking through the experience and walking through what are the questions they can ask? What do we need to be prepared for? How can we make sure we're all consistent in delivering it? How can we make sure that they know we want to be a hero to them so they can be a hero to their pets because it's not our job to be a hero to their pets. It's our job to be a hero to them so they could show up, which means we now have to give them information and products and guidance and support and a way to celebrate. And that's why the community was launched. The community was launched as the hub where they can come do all of those things. They can get questions answered. They can say I've arrived and I'm celebrating. They can share pictures. They can ask, for advice or support, they can, they're just gonna be offsets of groups. One of the things we're doing is breed specific too. Like if you have a Dalmatian, this is what you need. If you have a Chow, this is what you need. Because sometimes it's different. Maybe 80% of it's the same, but 20% is different. So based on our clients, what we're doing is showing up and letting them know what they need for the breed that they're in love with. And if it's a mixed breed, which generally are the most healthy, or the mutts actually, then that this is what you do. Ironically, last year, our number one video that was seen in all of our brands was, why does my dog eat grass? <laughs> right? So now, do I want my, why does my dog eat grass? Or would I be more interested in, why does my Shih Tzu eat grass? Because maybe why my Shih Tzu eats grass might be different than why another dog does. Maybe it's the same. But which one's going to be more interesting to me when I'm looking? If I have a Shih Tzu, I think I'm going to want to know exactly what, because sometimes the way that their skin is or the way their digestion is, is based on the breed. It could be just a little subtle difference, but if you understand me and you get me better, that's where I want to be. So that's how we want to show up. And the only way to do that is in this website. There's no way I could do it for every single person in person anymore. We did for many, many years, but we're realizing it's bigger than just us. It's a movement. It's a movement. Yeah. If you want to check it out, it's mypetthrives.com, plural. Um, what is, was a breakthrough for you? We're working through this with the team, with the client journey. That they get it and they understand it. And that when they have a rite of passage, they're like, oh, in this piece, the client's going to receive an automated piece from Infusionsoft. What should we expect to be the next step? If this, then what? Do they respond? And if they respond, what do I do? If they don't respond, do I follow up with a phone call? But seeing that they greet it. Here, they put in team huddles. Do you know how happy it makes me that I don't have to say, where's your team huddle? And they're like, nope, they built it in. So what this did was let me know that the team is on the right path. By the way, all of this was done. I wasn't in the room. Hmm. This is them showing me what they did while I was gone so I can give my input before it went to the next phase. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that we do here together. There's even the, this is client journey. This one here is every single piece of the puzzle from health and medical to nutrition to behavior and then they talk about all the different things mm. that they would do in that case. So it's always growing and expanding. But I think what this did for me was let me know the team's on the right track and they're paying attention.
So in that situation, it's like, oh, they're interested in something with health. We need to show X, Y, Z products. And I want you to talk a little bit about you. You, I think, have some custom formulations and uh, products. Um, one of them, Nutra Thrive. You want to talk a little bit about how that came to be and, and about those, what you have available. Yeah, thank you. In the back of our book, we put 50 original recipes for pets. And some are for cats, some are for dogs, some are based on digestion or skin. And what we realized is that if you go back to when they started making dried food and the bag, it's in the 1970s. And actually, that's when the length of average expectancy for dogs started shrinking. So back then, dogs were living to be 17 or 18. And if you go to ultimatedoghealth.com, there's a 17-minute video just there on why we were inspired to launch the Nutrithrive. And what happened with that is I do love my dogs very, very much. And I had a 12 and 13-year-old dog at the time. And after my husband had put me back together in the hospital, there was things he learned that he started doing for us for our longevity. And then he's like, well, what we're doing for us, we need to do for animals. And pets are not eating the right things right now. If they're eating bagged dog food is not the way that they're supposed to be eating. Like a raw food diet is actually better for them. So we started getting them a raw food diet and then he started putting the ingredients together as a supplement for them. And then we started seeing it working. It was working. It, it was working for people who, whose dogs were having really bad digestive problems or really bad skin problems or just all different kinds of things that it addresses. And it's 40 original ingredients, including probiotics and prebiotics and Japanese mushrooms. And honestly, if you went to source it all on your own today, one little container would be over $200. <laughs> But what he did was he worked with a group where they can not only source the ingredients, but put the formula together, produce it. And I think we're like on our third or fourth mass, uh, you know, build out of that because they physically have to source it and make it. And um, it's just extraordinary the feedback we're getting. We now have one for cats, ultimatecathealth.com. We also have dog treats and chewy bones and we're in the process of actually creating formulas for food. The formulas are already created. We're in testing right now. And it's mostly so that we can get back to close to the source for pets as well. And, and a source you can really count on, but also isn't bad for the environment at the same time. So there's so many factors to think about around how do you help pets, but also how do you make it so that it's also positive for the environment. So, so that's the nutritional piece, Lee, people can check it out on ultimatedoghealth.com. Is that where they can find it? Yes. Ultimatedoghealth.com is one of the places they can find it. Um, you might have already seen some Facebook ads because we're, we're doing that as well. And uh, yeah, the word is getting- what about the book? Where can people- The book is on book? Amazon and it's called The Ultimate Pet Health Guide. And awesome. I have a couple we actually have had it translated in Japanese and Polish and it's amazing like how Hay House is the publisher and it's amazing how many different countries it's being um, produced right now. I have those right here. Would you like me to show Yeah, you? yeah, totally. Let's see. Is there an audio version for or is it? Uh, it's more it's more of a you look up the chapter that you need. You don't just sit oh, down. Oh, it's like a resource guide. I got you. Okay, the ultimate pet health guide. Yeah, okay. totally. Chinese, this one here. Um, but yeah, this is it. Uh, Hay House published it. We're actually going to be doing some updates on it. And um, the 50 original recipes in the back are worth it just because people mm. can make a whole week's worth of food. If their dog has any issues that they need to address, there's a lot in there that can help them. Because honestly, food is medicine. And the more we can use food as the source for healing our body, the better yeah. we are. I was there looking is around because I have a book that's like my favorite book of all time. It's just Prescriptions of Nutritional Healing, which is like yours is like the pet equivalent to nutritional, you know, prescription of nutritional healing for, yeah. for people. And it's amazing how many thank you notes I get from people that they're like, thank God I had this resource right here. It's helped them be more proactive. Even one of the things I talk to medical doctors about is how much pet health can be the gateway to better health for people. Because people literally every day will come in and I'll hear them on the way out saying, wow, that works so great for my pet. Maybe I should do it for myself. And I'm like, you've never done that for yourself before. It might be acupuncture. It might be different things. And they're like, no, but I see my dog's doing so much better. I'm going to go try it. And I'm like, it's amazing how much our health can improve just by doing good for others, right? Totally. Lee, first of all, thank you. 
I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been absolutely uh, amazing to hear your story. Um, a lot of things, I do a lot of research and a lot of this did not uncover any of it. Um, so thank you. People should check out mypetthrives.com. Um, I have one last question, but where else should we point people towards besides mypetthrives.com? Uh, well, my personal brand is Go Ask Lee. Okay. Asklee.com. And so I'll be posting things on there. I, you know, when I have speeches or different presentations, yep. uh, I'll share them on there. And um, yeah, I just love connecting with people. Of course, on social media, we're on Instagram, go ask Lee on Instagram and also on Facebook that way as well. Go ask Lee.com. If you go on there, like I did, and there's a really cool video, watch her talk for about four minutes about some of the stuff that she's worked on. And you will also see a picture with her and Oprah on there, which is, which is kind of cool to see. Um, I've been with her a couple of times and I will tell you that is one of the highlights of doing good in the world is other good people notice and want to meet you. And yeah. so I've had some experiences. Sometimes they've asked for copies of my daughter's books and I've met them that way, like Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton that way. And like just having those opportunities to cross paths with other global leaders, whether I agree with them or not, they still have a presence about them that's worthy of paying attention. And so um, I love that that happens like that. Yeah. Check out mypetthrives.com. Go ask Lee, L E E.com. My last question, Lee, and there's so much um, that we cover, so much that we didn't. You know, you're always, to me, I see as a perpetual learner, a perpetual person who likes to learn from someone virtually, but also in person. And I know you're, you meet a lot of different leaders and entrepreneurs, and you're in a lot of different groups. Um, I'm just wondering, I don't know if you mentioned a few of your, your mentors or colleagues that you respect and maybe like a bit about what you learn from them. Cause I know you have a lot well, of. Lou Holtz was my first mentor. I mean, having that opportunity and I, and just seeing him last year for Christmas, um, we were at Harvey McKay's house and he's one of Harvey's best friends and, and having that intersection of time with him and reminiscing was really beautiful. And I loved him because he was so disciplined and he was so matter of fact, this is how you do it. No ifs, ands, or buts, zero excuses that I think it was a good conditioning for me early on. Um, another thing is at Merrill Lynch, the first thing they had me do was a disc profile. Now, this is back in the 80s. We still did disc profiles. It's been around a long time. By doing that, I realized how I was hardwired. So I do have goasklee.com slash disc, which is a link to the Tony Robbins link, goasklee.com slash disc, so that anyone can do the disc and just at least see where they are on the board. You know, where do you fit in? Who are your people? How do you serve? Um, I use it for every single person we hire. Um, but part of the reason I got the opportunities I did is because of how my disc said I would show up. And, and then people like Lou Holtz helped shine it. When I look at the people now who are really inspiring the most, a lot of them are just like amazing people that are friends of mine, just watching what they're doing behind the scenes and us being transparent with each other. But I have to give a real big hats off, of course, to Dan Sullivan at Strategic Coach, uh, not only for putting together such an incredible group of people to work with, but to work beside. Uh, he brought me in his group called The Game Changer, which is now um, in our second or third year where we just meet with other exceptional people. Uh, Joe Polish is in that group, who's another mentor of mine. Dean Jackson is in that group. Um, when I look at people like Gino Wickman, like I'm blown away by how his mind works and how he really cares about people and what he's doing next and just being able to, to see inside of, um, you know, how it gets created and how it gets out there and what they worry about. You know, what keeps people up at night and what they're asking for help with in hot seats is so valuable to me because it lets me know I'm not alone, but it also lets me know what to pay attention to. Mm. Because maybe I don't have that challenge right now, but when I do, based on their questions and how their questions and how they solve it, it gives me a roadmap to say, hey, when that happens, I won't be going through it by myself. I have them to, re to refer to, but I also have their learning lessons to call upon. So it shortens my learning curve, I guess. Yeah. But it also gives me access to ideas that are bigger than I probably ever would have come up with on my own or access to partners for collaboration that other people would just be a phone call away. But with them, we're actually hot seating and, and there's actual opportunities there. So, yeah. so I think it's that way. I just love networking. That's one of those 13 ways is networking. And that's just one, you know, I happen to love people. On that disc profile, originally what I learned is for lifelong learning, I'm a 10 out of 10. That means it is so extremely important to me. And what happened was when my husband saw that, he said, oh, now I get it, you have to go. So he was more understanding. It wasn't me just going on a trip. 
It's me thirsty for knowledge and going to the well. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Everyone check out mypetthrives.com. Go ask Lee.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you sharing your genius with the planet and being consistent and being patient like you are. And I'm glad we had this time together. Thank you, Lee. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.